Well, hey, welcome all you wiretappers out there. Good to be back here in the studio. I've got a special guest today, Anjay Nagpal. He's formerly the chief content officer at Bronze Studios, and he's now moving into the world of podcasts. So he's been in the movies, and now he's moving into my realm, into the podcast realm. Welcome, Anjay. Hi, Gary. Thanks so much for having me, and I'm really excited to be here. Well, good. Now, I've listened to your podcast, Brokers, Bagmen, and Moles, and I find it most entertaining and most interesting. It's a great story that's big, like I like them, you know, big, sprawling kind of stories like all mob stories are. Yours isn't specifically just a mob story. You go outside of the mob or the outfit, but it's a really interesting story. And you've been in the film industry for quite a while. And now you're going into the audio or the podcast industry and you're going into the nonfiction podcast industry and you've got several investigative pieces lined up. And this was the first one, correct? Yep, that's correct. You know, I love podcasts. I love the audio format. And the way I look at it is whether it's a movie or a podcast, I want to be a part of telling really interesting stories. Like you said, big stories, meaningful stories, and also kind of want to make movies and TV shows about the podcasts that we're making and to have these podcasts serve as kind of the intellectual property. We're making the story and then we're going to go do something else with it. But making podcasts has been a blast and I look forward to making a lot more. Oh, I see. So like this one is about hanky panky and hijinks and corrupt activities at the Chicago Board of Trade. So then you might make a movie but based on parts of this, because you couldn't do the whole thing in a two-hour movie. I'll tell you that right now. It's too big. But you would then take part of this and make it into a movie like the undercovers that work there and some of the characters that you ran into. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly right. You got it. Interesting. That will be an interesting movie because it's a crazy story. So you're connected to the Chicago outfit in this story, and it's about the Chicago Board of Trade. So kind of... Give us a little taste of what an overview, I guess, of what we're going to talk about today. And how does it connect to the outfit? Because, you know, my guys, my wiretappers out there love the Chicago outfit. I got a ton of fans up in Chicago. I know a bunch of them personally. I've been up there on the a Chicago mob tour on my motorcycle and met several guys. So tell us a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Sure. Well, Gary, first of all, you are the expert in this realm. I've listened to your show a bunch and you are, like I said, the authority. And so I look forward to speaking about the topic because I know you know your stuff. And let's maybe just high level explain yeah. what this podcast is about and what this FBI investigation is about. Just really a high level. I don't think we need to, like you said, get into the intricate details. And then you'll quickly understand how the Chicago outfit could find its way into the story as it does of many things in Chicago, especially when there's money around, right? Oh yeah. So it's there. Yeah. Yeah. They know how to sniff out money when it's flowing, but this podcast brokers, bagman and moles is about what was at the time, the most expensive investigation in the history of the FBI. And the reason it was so expensive is because it was designed to uncover futures brokers on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, who the FBI thought were stealing a ton of money from their customers, right? And just in general, how they thought that worked was they said they thought that all these customers from around the world, really, a lot of them are bankers and things like that, would call down to the trading floor and say, hey, they want to make a trade. But those customers weren't on the floor, right? They were somewhere else. And the customer or the brokers on the floor that were handling their orders the FBI thought were kind of manipulating them. They had fellow conspirators who were they were trading with. They were ripping off the customer and kind of splitting the difference. Does that do a good enough overview <laughs> of what we think? You know, basically skimming, right? From like their customers' okay. orders, taking a couple of bucks here and a couple of bucks there yeah. from their unwitting customers and giving them different prices on stuff than they actually traded. And there's a bunch of different ways to cheat down there. And, or there was, I should say, when the trading floors were operating, the rules were pretty loosely enforced and the whole place made it pretty easy to put some dollars in your pocket that you shouldn't. And so that was kind of the underlying thesis of the investigation and the FBI pretty daringly put four agents as undercover agents, told them to pose as brokers and go into those trading pits and pretend to be a Chicago trader. And even before any actual involvement with the outfit or the mafia, it's kind of a similar assignment to have to 
infiltrate Chicago traders like it is the mafia, right? Because this is a closed society. Everyone knows everyone. And just showing up at the exchanges and try to slide right in next to people who have been there their whole lives and who all know each other, right? That right there is not an easy assignment for the FBI. And then they got to learn how to trade and do all this stuff. So instantly, yeah, I knew this was an intriguing investigation, but what was the craziest part about it was that when I talked to traders about the investigation, they all told me it was a failure and a total waste of taxpayer money and the FBI didn't know what they were doing. But then if you read the government side of the story, they kind of say the opposite. They're like, well, this reformed financial markets, it was totally successful. And so that pulled me in and I wanted to figure out where the truth lies. Interesting. Yeah. For an agent to fit in with that, if they hadn't ever done this kind of work before, they probably were had a hard time finding anybody that had really done that kind of work down on the floor. They're trading floors where they're screaming and yelling and nobody understands what's going on down there. If anybody's seen those images, nobody understands what's going on. And I told you before, I had a guy ask a guy that used to work up there about, how do you trade futures and get into that? I want to make big money. And he said, I'm not telling you, it's like gambling. And so it's like gambling going on and all these characters that are in that and to get in with that group undercover <laughs> and fit in with them, get people to tell you stuff would be hard. You'd have to be a pretty heavy drinker and probably a cocaine user to ever get in with them. Tell us a little bit about their personal habits, their personal lives of those traders on the floor. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of all the things you think about, all the cliches. I mean, it's funny because, yeah, definitely there was a lot of drinking going on, a ton. There are bars right there in the exchanges and drugs are also very prevalent. I mean, a lot of these people made a lot of money and they like to party. It's kind of like classic Wall Street, work hard, play hard mentality, except the kind of Chicago version with a little bit of different flavor. But yeah, there was kind of a lot of partying and a lot of crazy behavior going on. And it wasn't everyone, right? Obviously, there's a fair amount of people that kind of did their job and went home and were good family people. But a lot of the younger guys that kind of just went at it really hard. <laughs> yeah. It was brats and beer and whiskey rather than caviar and champagne. Huh? <laughs> That's right. Old style and Malort. You know? <laughs> really? So I guess... Tell us about how did the mafia, I know you got one segment, how did the mafia get into this? I mean, what was their piece of it? I remember one guy knew the Spilatro brothers and everybody, Chicago is a big city, but yet it's a small city in some ways. And a lot of people know each other and they know who's doing what. So tell us how that, yeah. how that get into the mob. Well, I'm glad you said that too, because that's a big part of our shows. And in fact, episode one of our show is called The Biggest Small Town in the World. Yeah. And we really kind of set the table for the series because it is that, right? It's like, yeah, I mean, there might be a couple thousand people on the floor, but it is kind of like everyone knows everyone somehow. And that was one of my first things. Like I was a trader for a few years, much after this happened, like 15 years after this investigation. So things had changed a lot, but it was still like everyone knew everyone. And I'm just kind of like, I don't understand how this is possible. But, you know, a lot of this is like people treated it like a family business. So there's multi-generations of traders, right? Two or three generations dating back to the 1800s. So people get that kind of wealth. They get those kind of positions and they keep it in the family. And then as they started, these exchanges grew a lot in the 70s and 80s because they really grew from agricultural exchanges to financial exchanges. And then there was just a lot more business and a lot of people brought in their friends, right? And so going to the mafia part of it, there were a lot of traders of Italian descent, first and foremost. And especially as they expanded, a lot of them brought in their friends and family. And one specific example of that in episode seven, it's about a trader, a really prolific trader named Louis Borsellino. And he was in the S&P 500 futures pit, which that's a big pit. There's a couple hundred people in there. He was the biggest trader in there for a while or one of the biggest. And he tells a funny story where as the exchanges were growing, he kept bringing his friends from the neighborhood, a lot of Italian friends, and a whole section of the pit they called Little Italy. He's a great storyteller. That episode's a lot of fun. And he makes some great revelations in it. But that was kind of it. It was like a couple of them got in there and they started bringing their friends because what was crazy about these exchanges is there wasn't really much of a barrier to entry to get in. Like you didn't have to have a finance degree or an MBA or take a Series 7 or a Series 63 or any of these kind of other qualifications that you have for a lot of Wall Street jobs and a lot of trading jobs. And so who are you going to bring down there? 
but your friends. And so that's kind of how it grew. And I'm happy to talk more about Borsalino in that episode because it's really fascinating. Yeah, let's hear a little more about that. Mob always has money to wash, try to clean up a little bit. Did you have any examples of that, for example? I mean, but by then CTRs were in the cash transaction record. So you couldn't just bring a big bunch of cash down there and do it. Did you run into any examples of that, washing dirty money through? That we've been looking for a lot, and it's kind of the hardest part to prove. But one thing that we did uncover in our show is that, first of all, if you read about this investigation, there's really not much on the internet. Like if you go to Wikipedia, it doesn't exist. These uh. operations were called Operation Sour Mash and Operation Hedge Clipper. One, one was at the Merck and the other at the Board of Trade. So there's two. And there's not a lot of records there, but all the public record talks about is looking for brokers cheating their customers. And the more I kind of talk to people down there, especially some kind of mafia related folks, yeah, money laundering came up. We heard a couple mentions, read a couple mentions of money laundering in trial transcripts and in old newspaper articles, but there wasn't anything tangible there. But the more we talked to people and since found some evidence in some FBI files that we received with a FOIA request that will be revealed and then some trial transcripts, we have confirmed that the FBI certainly was investigating mafia activity and the potential of money laundering on the floor. And that's never before been publicly revealed. So part of this case really was about looking for mafia activity on the floor of the exchange. And if you think about it, like that's a pretty crazy statement that I don't know of any other cases that involve the interaction of whether it's a Chicago outfit or any mafia and like inside of our financial markets, right? So right. it's a landmark case for that. Well, now give us an example of outfit involvement. How would that work? Sure. I mean, first of all, there's a lot of clean outfit involvement. And what I mean by that is, for example, the gentleman I brought up earlier, Louis Borsellino, he did not, and his father was a hitman for the mafia and enforcer, and that's public. And he was actually murdered when Lewis was a teenager, I believe. And it's a really kind of a heart-wrenching story. We talk about that in our episode. But Lewis has always said, I'm not going to be involved in that activity. I'm choosing a different path in life. And so whether it was him or others, there was a lot of, let's say, sons, nephews, and people like that on the floor that had those mafia ties, right? Like one person removed, whether it was their brother. So for example, the Spilatros, Anthony and Michael Spilatro were never at the exchanges, but they had a brother, I believe it was, his name is escaping me right now. Oh, but yeah, they have a, oh, oh, it's Patrick. Patrick, that's what it was. Patrick Spilatro. He was a trader for a little while and he was sponsored to come down to the floor by a guy named Jimmy Colentis, who's a pretty well-known mob. That's an associate friend. And he grew up with the Spilatros. He was friends with both Anthony and Michael, and he sponsored Patrick Spilatro to come down on the floor. He also, I believe, employed two Spilatro nephews. I don't know exactly which ones they were. So you had those kind of ties and you had these people all around, right? And so that kind of set the stage for the FBI looking into this and as well as the potential of activity to take place down there. And one thing that you alluded to like what kind of activity would be down there well traders like to gamble <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and so bookmaking operations right that's one and then obviously drugs traders like to do drugs so some of the things that were money makers for the outfit had traders as their customers and so it's not hard to make a leap to say okay well traders have money traders like to gamble and some of them like to do drugs and so that's kind of the connection right there i would imagine it'd be some loan sharking too because people they got their ups and downs because as my friend RJ said, it's just like gambling. I'm not telling you about it. It's like gambling. So every once in a while, somebody's going to lose big time and you got a loan shark out there to step in. Did you run into any examples of that? Or is that ever reported in any manner? Yeah, there was actually one. And again, I haven't been able to substantiate it yet, but there was a pretty high level Merck executive that I'd heard was some taking some loans to pay back some losses on trades and stuff and kind of disappeared for a while um, and then yeah. reappeared. And so that definitely was all around as well. And so one actually on that front, kind of another one of the revelations that came from our show was 
that Louis Borsellino, again, in episode seven, our show revolved around these kind of unanswered questions about this investigation. And one of them was like, what really started this? Like, how did the FBI ever know that this kind of stuff was going on on the floor, right? Like, it's not something you can easy have access to. You can't just walk down there and see what's going on. So how did they hear about it, right? And in episode seven, Louis Borsellino tells us, well, first and foremost, the kind of conventional wisdom is that there was a big agricultural company called Archer Daniels Midland, huge food processing company. The conventional wisdom was that they complained to the FBI, hey, we're getting ripped off down here. The FBI said, well, they're a big company. We're going to do something about it. What Louis Borsellino told us was two things. First, that the FBI was wiring bookies and drug dealers around town, as they do, especially in the 80s, and that they would hear over and over again on the wiretaps, well, hey, oh, I lost 50 grand. Don't worry about it. I'll pay you. I'll steal it off the deck tomorrow. And what that that's a term for, I'll steal it off the deck, means I'll rip off my customers. Like I have these customer orders. I'm going to rip off my customers. I'm going to put a bunch of money in my pocket. I'm going to use that to pay my gambling debts, right? And so that was the first time anyone had ever heard that. And I was shocked to hear it, but it makes sense, right? Like how would the FBI know what's going on in the floor while well, they're hearing traders talk to bookies or they're hearing traders talk to drug dealers. And in fact, at one point, Mr. Borsellino said that some of the bookies, he would get calls from bookies every once in a while asking, Hey, this so-and-so is placing a big bet. If he loses, is he good for it? You know, <laughs> I but he you. said, and he, yeah. So there's a lot of that going on. Interesting. I can see where all that would happen. And it's really hard to run down and prove and people are cagey. And I know in one of those episodes I listened to, I thought it was really interesting. As any FBI investigation, you get somebody and you turn them. You try to find a, somebody that's vulnerable in some manner and turn them. And nobody supposedly has, knows that they've been even approached with by the Bureau. And they turn this guy wired him up and he goes to one of the more flamboyant traders and then tries to engage him in conversation about some little deal. <laughs> that, that was priceless, that whole conversation. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. We did a reenactment there, but based on the right. actual transcripts from the right. pit. And I mean, what a crazy situation, right? To <laughs> to try to basically, he tried to get this guy to talk about these illegal <laughs> trades. And the guy was just like, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. All those <laughs> trades were legal trades. Really? All those, everything we've done has been above board. I don't know what you're talking about. But that was also kind of, I think, one of the things that the FBI probably wasn't anticipating was that a lot of these guys, yeah, maybe they weren't college educated, Ivy League educated, but some of them were pretty darn street smart. And so a lot of them didn't talk. Like you said, they thought they'd kind of get a bunch of people to turn on each other but a lot of them didn't. That's another thing that really hurt their investigation was that these guys, I think you listen to episode two and three with T-Bun and he, he yeah. tells them to go bleep themselves and slams the door in the FBI's face. And yeah. you know, I can't imagine they were expecting that when they were talking about investigating our financial futures markets and financial markets. Really a, a priceless line out of that. I made a note of it here. There's no story, Dave. Every trade we ever made was legitimate trade. <laughs> like, okay. I mean, he said it in real strong voice too. Like this kind of conversation's done. <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can make that up, right? Like if you're watching a TV show and you saw that, you'd be like, oh, that's great writing right there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You can't make that kind of that real stuff up. That's interesting. I did that in one of my documentary movies. I didn't have the actual audio but I had the transcript from it. So I had a couple of actors, actors that were talking about killing this guy and there are different plans on how to kill him. And you can't make that kind of real conversation up. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So where do you want to go next, Gary? And by the way, I didn't even say it, but I'm a huge fan of your show. And I know that you are an absolute expert on the <laughs> Chicago outfit and have written some books and made some documentaries about it. So yeah, I appreciate that. My stuff's mainly about Kansas City and I'm not the expert. There's real experts on the outfit. I just kind of have learned a lot from them over the years, but I appreciate that. So I guess this board of trade and the agents, did any of the agents stick out to you? I know that a lot of them tried to do their best, but tell us about one of the agents that stuck out to you, a little bit about him. Yeah, for sure. There's five agents that we spoke to, three on the record. And there was one in particular, and I don't know when this episode is going to air. So I'm going to 
hold back some spoilers, okay. but basically there was one FBI agent in particular who is a subject of episode 11, who is kind of went above and beyond, right? They all did their jobs. And one thing I have to say is that going into this, I didn't quite understand kind of how hard of a job the FBI had, you know, and I gained a lot of respect for what they did. But this agent in particular, he kind of knew the the investigation was challenged, right? All the things we've talked about, like getting people to cooperate, gaining their trust, even just being able to prove in court that, hey, this trade was illegal. It was hard. And so this guy kind of went above and beyond in a way that his mindset was like, I'm just going to try to get as many people as possible to do illegal things and to talk about illegal things because that will just show this like massive pattern of corruption and that these traders are all susceptible to committing crimes and that they're all in this environment of lawlessness, basically. So some of the things he did were, yeah, if you think about how did Al Capone go down, right? They didn't catch him murdering someone. He went down for tax evasion, Mm -hmm. right? And so these kind of like really smart tricks and schemes to kind of pull people into, oh, well, now we got you doing something illegal, right? Whether it's tax evasion, whether it's gambling, whether it's whatever, it's a really interesting mindset that he went to do that. And I get it. Like he wanted to do his job and he knew that there was theft going on down there and that people were playing fast and loose with the rules. And, but he also knew that he had a really hard job. And so wanted to do whatever it took to get the job done. One of the other agents said of him, Hey, if you told him to run through a brick wall for the FBI, he'd do it in a second. <laughs> I remember guys like that. We had a saying we were going to take some guys in one of our SWAT team and I was one of the sergeants. And so this one guy interviewed in front of us and then he left. And one of the other sergeants, he said, that's the kind of guy, if you tell him to break out a plate glass window with his head and then take his neck and go all around and clear out all of extra glass in the window, he'd do it. <laughs> that kind <That's> of right. guy. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, it's a great podcast. I'm trying to think. There must be something else, of course. Is there anything yeah. anyplace else you want to go here? There's a couple of other things we can talk about. Okay. Um, I think just in terms of interesting characters, I mean, first and foremost, we talk about a character kind of throughout the show, a man named Jimmy Calentis, who you, I think you mentioned very briefly at the beginning, and we'd heard all kinds of rumors about him. And there was speculation that the FBI was trying to take down his brokerage firm. And so there's kind of, if you piece together over time, you can kind of see that his association with the Spalatro brothers, as well as we found some blogs online that talk about him shaking down traders. He had this supposedly had this whole scheme where he would go up to traders and say, Hey man, I think the exchange saw you doing some crooked trades and they're going to get you in trouble. Like I can talk to him. I can get you out of that trouble, but you got to give me 50 grand or you got to give me some money yeah. and trying to shake some people down on the floor. Again, we haven't been able to confirm that other than talking to people. And then another kind of thing that he and that company were accused of is like, and this is really interesting. It's kind of where the lines blur between mafia-like activity, cartel-like activity <laughs> and good business, right? Because like one of the things they did was when their exchange first started, all the brokers were just individuals. I would be a broker. You could be a broker. We compete against each other. And then at some point, I believe in the late seventies or early eighties, they started having associations, broker groups, like, Hey, why don't we pool our resources? We'll have people in different pits. We'll have we'll just be a bigger business more diversified, all that kind of stuff. And then the way that brokers got paid was they got a fixed dollar amount for contract and that it changed over time. But if I filled one contract, let's say I got a dollar and 25 cents, right? So if I do a thousand contracts a day, I'm making $1,250. That's good money. And so how do you compete and how do you grow? So this company, ABS Partners that we talk about, there's a lot of people have told me that one of the ways that they got bigger and they grew was through basically discounting their brokerage fees and giving kickbacks to those customers. So if there was someone at a hedge fund or a bank or something was using a different one of their competitors, these guys would walk over to them and say, hey, why don't you use us? We'll discount your brokerage and we'll give it back to you. You pay us the the $1.25 per contract. We'll give you a little kickback under the table, a little envelope of cash at the end of the year. And kind of that's the way they grew. And on one hand, it's like, wow, it's illegal. The price was the price for commissions. But on the other hand, that's how legal 
brokerage firms have grown over time. It's like, hey, yeah, you got to make trading cheaper for people. And that's how you get more business is price competition, right? Yeah. So it was not above board, but just really interesting kind of the gray area of business and the way that things happen down on the Merck. And kind of the last thing I want to say about that is like the conclusion of our show, really, we talk about the big picture. Why was it such a gray area? Why were the rules? Why was it easy to cheat? Right. And who made up these rules and how did they get to be that way and how they get to stay that way? Because there certainly was technology and other ways to create a clear audit trail and make it harder to cheat, make it harder to steal. But for some reason that didn't evolve as fast as it could have. And that's kind of what, where we go to a lot towards the end. Interesting. Well, folks, the podcast is Brokers, Bagmen, and Moles, hosted by NJ Nagpal. And I really appreciate you coming on the show and telling about the Chicago outfit and their connection to the Chicago Board of Trade. And there's two different operations, Chicago Board of Trade and what was the other one? It's the Chicago Board of Trade and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. All right, great. Well, I really appreciate it. Okay, folks, NJ Nagpal of Brokers, Bagmen, and Moles, a new podcast. I'll have a link to it down below. And is there anything else you want to promote here, NJ, or any other links I could put up to help you out? Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of things to just mention briefly. I mean, first and foremost, when it comes to this, I'd love to chat with you again for a minute off the record or on, because we have some more outfit stuff that we're learning and that we're kind of still working on. So there's more to come when it comes to the outfit activity and brokers, bagmen, and moles. Second of all, we also have a few other podcasts that are going to be based on, or at least somewhat involving not only the outfit, but certain parts of the family secrets investigation and trial and some of the people involved in that. There's one there about the Calabrese family. And then there's another show about Milwaukee in the Ballastory clan and that reign. So fascinating stories, all of them. So hopefully there's more to talk about in the future. It sounds like it. Now I'm kind of excited now. I haven't done much on Milwaukee. I've done, I think, one show, a guy named Gavin Smith up there. But that Milwaukee Connections needs to be looked at closer because they had some stuff going on, plus their connection to the skim out in Las Vegas. That's really hardly, it's just barely ever been reported anywhere. And they were really into it big time. Yep, yep. And we've got the stories and we've got some FBI archival recordings and wiretaps and all that stuff. And that's going to be a fun one. So I look forward to telling you more about it and can't wait to share it with you and your audience. Okay, Angie, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Awesome. Thanks so much, Gary. This has been a blast. Appreciate it. Okay. You guys, you know that I like to ride motorcycles. So watch out for motorcycles when you're out there. And if you have a problem with PTSD, be sure and go to the VA website if you've been in the service and get that hotline number. And if you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, our good friend and former Gambino guy, Anthony Ruggiano, works in a treatment center down in Florida. And on his website, he has a hotline number. So there you go. Thanks a lot, guys. And oh, I always forget to do this. Like and subscribe and give me a review or I don't care. It's just fun for me. You know what I mean, NJ? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you All so right. much. And really, this has been a lot of fun. And like I said, we got some stuff in the future that okay, we, I can't great. wait to talk, talk to you about. Uh, be sure and keep me up on that. If I don't get to you first, oh, yeah. let me know. All right. Thanks a lot, NJ. Absolutely. Will do. Thank you.